make Hurry, Mr. Bergeron's on Don't forget the popcorn, Frank Coming, dear So, we're going to talk for a few minutes also about if you were in this kind of situation. So, what kind of planning ahead do you need to do with any, um, because of the finances involved, in being, um, in being frank. And, and uh, primarily, I know for the, for the folks that, we, that I've talked to, and I know we've talked about it here a lot, um, while a lot of the talk tends to be about how to deal with nursing homes, I think the real discussion really needs to be how to stay at home. And I think what you need to know is that when you are frail, you probably can stay at home. At least you can stay at home um, until you're really, really, really sick, right? And even probably then, we're gonna kind of talk about some of that also. So, if you are wanting to stay at home the way you are frail, then there are really kind of three possibilities. One is private pay, that is uh, family, friends, and others. <coughs> One is mass health, and there's something called the frail all the way, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. And then there's Medicare. And I think many of us don't, and, many of, many, and I certainly didn't, realize that there are some real options through Medicare, which all of you have, right, which don't require you to be doing any transfers of assets or anything else, that can really help you to stay at home and to be feeling better during this period that you're fret. Because once, once again, because there's the old line, you know, God, gives, God decides the number of days and we decide how to live. The question is not how many days you have, because you don't decide that question. The question is how you live every day, and that's really the question that we're kind of talking about. So, next, next slide, please. If you're thinking about, if, if, you, if, you want to, if you're trying to plan for this issue, what you really want to do is, you want to make sure that you've had conversations with family and friends. Um, if you've got family and friends that you think might be able to help you out if you get frail, if you have that stroke, if you're stuck at home, beforehand, you want to talk to the child, the daughter, the designated, I always call them the designated daughter. So in so many families, it's that one person who you kind of figure is going to be there to kind of help you out. But you want to have that conversation with her, or with him, with the designated son, or with the relative, or if you're not lucky enough to have any of those players kind of close by or in a situation that they might move here, you want to figure out who is it going to be. You may want to talk to somebody at the Council on Aging about that. You may want to talk to somebody at your church about that to figure out if you were trying to stay home, would it be possible to have somebody come in? And, and when you're trying to think about that, think about paying them. And the reason why I say that is, you know, at any of your children, not all of your children, but most of your children will say, oh, you don't have to think about that, you know? I mean, if, you're, if you really need me to help, I'll be there for you. But you know, you have to always put yourself in your children's positions. I mean, often they have financial stresses of their own, I know a number of children who have given up their jobs or changed jobs or shrunk down hours so that they could help their parent at home. That's putting a whole lot of stresses in a lot of different places. To the extent that you can, you may, think, you want, you may want to think about paying them for doing just that kind of stuff, right? You know, and, probably, and, and probably if you bring it up, they're going to be, I mean, they're not going to say this, but they're going to be delighted because they'll realize that they don't have to deal with this stress, even if you're paying them relatively small amounts. I mean, if you were paying a home care person to come into your home right now to do, not to be fixing your, you know, your, your doing your medicines and fixing your wounds and stuff, but just to be, you know, washing the dishes and visiting and stuff, you're gonna be paying them around today $20 an hour, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, right? may make a lot of sense for you to be talking to your child and say, well, you know, I'd be doing this anyway if I really needed somebody. So would you be willing to do that? The other reason why you may want to do that, especially if you're, suppose you've had a fall and you've come back home and you're getting better, but you're saying to yourself, you know, when you're, when you, once you're past the denial, you know, you're kind of saying to yourself, oh, I could be getting friend up here. You know, we all kind of know it, you know, and you've got your walker and, and you, you're needing more and more stuff, and you really get tired, you know, when you don't really feel like doing the dishes. Well, at that point, you, you know, you also need to know that, let, that down the line, in the event that you wanted to stay home and you got really frail, you may be able to qualify for something called a frail elder waiver, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But in order to qualify, that's a mass health program, it is assets-based, 
So you have to have less than $2,000 in countable assets to qualify. You may decide if you've got some savings in the bank, right, that this is a really good time to be basically transferring some of those savings to your child, which remember, you can't give them anything more than $1,000 within the five year, in, in an increment of more than $1,000 within the five years before you're trying to qualify for mass health. But you could pay them to be doing stuff for you in your home, and that could provide the benefit to you of having somebody in your home and also giving you the ability to basically shift assets that you would have otherwise had to spend down anyway on your health care and basically be paying them to your child. So there may be reasons why you want to do that. If you don't have those options, if you don't have a family or friend, there are home care agencies. I think we've introduced you to some of those folks here. You may want to just talk to them and find out what, how they, what they charge, how they charge. If you don't know any of them, talk to the folks here from the Council on Aging, because they, well, they have pretty much vetted the home care agencies that they feel like they trust and that they know are competent, right? Or you can talk to your church. Now, are there any churches here, for the folks who are here, in Hudson, that have a program, any kind of program to have folks go visit folks that are that are frail in the home? Could you raise your hand if you're in a church that's got that kind of program? Yes? 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 There's a nurse in your parish. What parish is that? At St. Michael's? Yes. So I think, in, in, and yes? And in St. Luke's also, there's a, there's a program. And that's really terrific. And I know one of the things that we've been trying to do is encourage the interfaith councils in, in various communities to be looking at that jointly and to be kind of encouraging each other to provide those kinds of services. Because especially if you don't have a, you know, a daughter or a close friend or the neighbor that's around the corner, a lot of times you get somebody through the church and you're going to feel a lot more comfortable about them coming in. Next slide, please. Um, about the frail elder way, I guess the thing to understand is that if you're getting frail that way, even if you haven't planned a lot in advance, if, if you are, if, if, especially if there are still two of you, right? If there's you and your spouse and you're getting frail, then chances are you're going to be able to qualify for this thing called the frail elder waiver. And the way you do that is if you can clinically demonstrate, or if, if, the, if the area uh, elder services agency, which here is called Bay Path Elder Services, certifies that in the absence of the services you're getting at home, you would be eligible for nursing home care. Then you can qualify through something called the Frail Elder Waiver for a whole ton of mass health benefits to help your spouse and your family keep you at home that you would normally not qualify for. And I know we've talked about this a little bit, but I just wanted to go through this. Uh, in, if you're in that situation, if, if first of all, your income can't be more than $2,042 per month, but in that situation, your spouse's income isn't counted. So if you're both on Social Security or if you're both getting pensions or whatever, only your income is counted. You have to have countable assets of less than $2,000, but your spouse, for purposes of this program, can have infinite assets. So that all you have to do in that situation is simply transfer all your assets to your spouse. And that's okay. And then you can qualify for the frail elder waiver. And then, of course, there's the issue of, well, what happens if my spouse dies then, right? Because a lot of times, by the way, that happens. I see that a lot, that the healthy spouse is the one that kind of drops dead from taking care of the other spouse. Who just, I know it's kind of sad, right? But, you know, we all know these cases, right? I mean, because you just, you know, you die of worry for your other spouse. So what happens in that situation? Well, what you can do in that situation is you transfer all the assets to the healthy spouse, and then the healthy spouse changes her will, or his will, to say, when I die, instead of everything going to my spouse, which is what most people's will say, right? You'd say, everything goes in trust for the benefit of my spouse. You name one of your kids as a trustee. That trust is legitimate. If the healthy spouse then dies, the assets that get put into trust are immediately safe. There's no five-year look-back period. There's none of that. So that the, 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 the frail spouse who is still living at home, who is, who is now dealing with the death of your husband or wife, doesn't have to also immediately face, oh, now I have to go to the nursing home because there's no, no way that I can afford to stay at home. So you can actually keep those benefits. Now, in order to do that, I mentioned that you have to have, you have to be clinically eligible. 
But for if we're talking about frailty, just about everybody who is frail, because when I, when I, when I, people say, well, what do you mean by frail? Well, to me, frail is you need help. You know, I mean, day to day, you're you're standing, or maybe not standing all the time, but you are. But you need help. You need help. And if you need help with three of the five activities of daily living, that's an official term. ADLs or activities of daily living. That's bathing, dressing, eating, toileting, or transferring. And the only obvious one, non-obvious one there is transferring. Transferring means getting up out of the chair, walking across the room, getting down again, getting out of your bed. It means being able to do these basic things without assistance. If, you, if there's three of those for which you need assistance, then you automatically qualify for nursing home care, which also means you qualify for the frail elder waiver. Um, even if you can do all of those things, uh, if, you, if you need uh, staff intervention needing monitoring, what does that mean? Well, you can do all of these things, but you might find yourself you know, just walking up 495 by mistake, which you're know, not remembering things really well. In that situation, too, even if you're physically healthy, you qualify for the frail elder waiver. So the important thing to know is that you don't need to have done a lot of fancy things in order to qualify for this ahead of time. Okay? Next slide. Um, also, if you're on the frail, el the, the frail elder waiver, suppose you're on it and, you're, and your spouse has died, and you can't possibly live at home. Um, you can qualify, and, and by the way, this is whether your spouse has died or not, but a lot of times people most need it when their spouse has died. Um, to actually have mass health pay your child to be at home with you, or pay some other person, but they'll pay somebody and they'll do through, through two different programs. One is called the PCA, or the Personal Care Attendant Program, through which they'll pay at an hourly rate. And I can't remember what the hourly rate is. You know what the hourly rate is? 